Good morning. Today's scripture comes from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 15 through 23. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, take a stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Judah and the Israelites associated with him. Then take another stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Joseph, that is, to Ephraim, and all the Israelites associated with him. Join them together into one stick, so that they will become one in your hand. When your people ask you, won't you tell us what you mean by this? Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am going to take the stick of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, and of the Israelite tribes associated with him, and join it to Judah's stick. I will make them into a single stick of wood, and they will become one in my hand. Hold before their eyes the sticks you have written on, and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, There will be one king over all of them, and they will never again be two nations or be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images or with any of their offenses. For I will save them from all their sinful backsliding, and I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Grace, for reading for us today. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, It's great to be with you, and I love seeing all your faces. You know, and you are all entering in here today and just seeing you all greet one another. It was just just glorious. I also want to thank Jeff Burnett, uh, representing the Finance Committee, and giving you an update of that. And I agree with him that I have a lot of confidence in this congregation. I have seen it over and over. That you love God, you love this church, you love one another, and uh, God lead us through it. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come as the fire and burn. Come as the wind and cleanse. Come as the light and reveal. Show us our sin. Turn us around. Set us apart until we are wholly yours. Amen. Well, today we are continuing the series we started last Sunday on offshoots, which is religious spinoffs of Orthodox Christianity. And I'm, and I'm not doing this series to put down other faiths, okay? I'm doing it because I believe that by examining what other groups believe, it helps us to clarify what we believe and why. And what do we believe? Well, there's a a lot of ways to approach that, but here's part of it. Here's the heart of today's message. I'm going to put it right up front. Christians receive the Bible as our authority for faith and practice, and we do not build our faith on sources that conflict with Scripture. You know, this this lines up with um, statements of faith that are historic for the United Methodist Church and a lot of other denominations It's kind of a basic belief of our our understanding of Scripture. Will you say it with me? Christians receive the Bible as our authority for faith and practice, and we do not build our faith on sources that conflict with Scripture. And so today, uh, in our series on offshoots, we're, we're looking at what do Mormons teach? Mormon is the name for a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, sometimes you might hear me today say the LDS. Well, that's short for Latter-day Saints or their, or their church. And the name Mormon comes from the Book of Mormon, uh, one of their scriptures. And, and, of course, the Book of Mormon is also the name of an award-winning Broadway musical. <laughs> some, of, some of you have seen it? Have you seen it, any of you? I have not, but a few, few people have. All right. Uh, I once knew a couple who were ex-Mormons. She married into the faith. 
He had been a fifth-generation Mormon. And after studying together, the two of them, they studied the origins of Mormonism. They quietly left the LDS, and they began worshiping at our United Methodist Church. Mormons, uh, you know some of them, I'm sure. You, uh, they put a high value on family. They tend to marry younger, marry within the faith, and have larger-than-average families. There are about 6.5 million Mormons in the United States. They tend to be whiter, younger, and more conservative than the average U.S. population. There are more than 16 million uh, Mormons worldwide. How do they start? Well, during the first half of the 1800s, the United States was filled with spiritual fervor. Church revivals and camp meetings were popular. Many, many people found salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Historians call this period the Second Great Awakening. Methodists, Baptists, and other denominations grew and spread rapidly during this time. In 1820, in western New York State, a 14-year-old boy was confused by all these denominations. Who's right? And he began fervently praying, asking God, which one was the true church? One spring morning, he was out walking in the woods. Young Joseph Smith knelt down and asked God to give him wisdom to know which denomination was right. He felt as if he was battling Satan in his soul. And then two persons appeared in physical bodies, in glorious light. They said they were the Father and the Son. And they told him to not join any church because they were all corrupt. And their creeds were an abomination to God. That was the first of many visions and visitations Joseph Smith would claim over his lifetime. Smith told about his second vis visitation three years later when he was 17 years old. Uh, the angel Moroni led him to find a book of gold plates, 14 centuries old, written in an ancient language. But Moroni said Smith had to wait another four years before he could open it. So after turning 21, Smith opened the plates and started translating them with the help of two stones that he said had special powers. And his translation became known as the Book of Mormon. Seminary professor Andrew Jackson says, Joseph Smith reported that he returned the original gold plates to the angel Moroni, who apparently took them to heaven. It's unclear whether anyone else ever physically saw those gold plates. The Book of Mormon tells about ancient, the ancient Israelites leaving the, uh, the Middle East and migrating to America. Today's American Indians, according to Mormons, are descendants of those Israelites. The American Israelites became two competing tribes. Uh, the chief of the more noble tribe was named Mormon. And it was more, and, and they were the, they all died out. They were killed by the bad tribe, I guess. Uh, but it was Mormon's son, the angel, who became the angel Moroni, who showed Smith these gold plates. Joseph Smith uh, even said that the Book of Mormon was prophesied in the Bible. Uh, he, he pointed to the passage that uh, Grace just read for us from Ezekiel 37 in the Old Testament. It's about, the passage is about God's chosen people, which at the time were divided into two kingdoms. A lot of you know this, with Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Well, God tells Ezekiel to take two sticks, one for each of the two nations, and then put them together as one stick in his hand to demonstrate that one day God will bring the two nations together as one. Let's, let's review verses 18 and 19. Uh, here the northern kingdom is referred to as Joseph in Ephraim's hand. It says, when your people ask you, 
Won't you tell us what you mean by this? Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am going to take the stick of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, and uh, the Israelites associated with him, and join it to Judah's stick. I will make them into a single stick of wood, and they will become one in my hand. Joseph Smith said God told him this passage had a completely different meaning. That the first stick, uh, Smith said, is the Bible, and the second stick is the Book of Mormon. Now, there's no way you're going to get that from reading Ezekiel. So it shows you how much Mormons trust Joseph Smith and his revelations. Mormons actually believe in four sacred books. Uh, the first is the Bible in the King James Version. But Joseph Smith also said that the Bible has been corrupted and mistranslated and is full of errors. And only the parts of the Bible that agree with the other authoritative Mormon books can be trusted. The second is the Book of Mormon, uh, which is mostly the story about uh, some of those Israelites who moved to America. Plus, it includes other kind of inspirational passages, a lot like our Bible. The other two are called the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrines and Covenants. And they contain really the, the most unique and unusual stuff about what Mormons believe. Joseph Smith, he liked to keep his followers all around him, close by, you know. And, that, and a lot of times wherever they were, they would face hostility from the local people who didn't like them and what they were doing and teaching. So the, the, the Mormons moved a lot. They started in New York and moved to Ohio and then to Missouri and then to Illinois. Joseph Smith even sent out uh, Mormon missionaries to promote his short-lived run for U.S. president. Did you know that? His vision was to create a nation built on Mormon law in preparation for Jesus' second coming. Well, that didn't go over very well. <laughs> uh, Smith and other Mormon leaders were arrested for treason and jailed in Carthage, Missouri. While awaiting trial, a mob entered the jail. They shot and killed Smith. The Mormon prophet was martyred at the age of 38. Unfortunately for the LDS, there was no succession plan. Uh, one of Joseph Smith's two wives believed that her oldest son, Joseph III, should take his father's place. Problem was, he was only 11 years old. <laughs> Interestingly, though, Joseph III later founded what was called the Reorganized Church of Latter-day Saints uh, in Independence, Missouri, it's now changed its name. It's called the Community of Christ. And their beliefs are somewhat closer to ordinary Christian beliefs. Mormon leadership after Joseph Smith passed to Brigham Young. You've heard that name. Uh, he was already an important leader in the LDS. Brigham Young decided to take his people to a place that was so isolated they wouldn't be bothered anymore. In February 1846, fearing that federal troops would come after them, the Mormons left Illinois and crossed into Iowa, where they waited out the winter. In the spring, they crossed through Iowa and made it to the Missouri River. Unfortunately, there was no Mormon bridge waiting for them. <laughs> and they had to cross by ferry. Interestingly, in North Omaha, in, in Florence Park at 30th and State Street, you will find a historical marker that says more than 3,000 Mormons spent that winter in, the, in that area before leaving for Utah. Brigham Young ruled the Mormons in Utah for 30 years until 1877. And, of course, during this time, polygamy was still practiced uh, by some Mormons, including leaders. Uh, Brigham Young himself married at least 20 women and fathered 56 children. 
But in order to make peace with the United States government, the fourth LDS president and prophet reported receiving a revelation from God in September 1890 that authorized him to stop the practice of polygamy. And that raises an interesting point about the Latter-day Saints, the office of prophet and president. It holds great power. This is an authoritarian organization. The, their leader is not even bound by revelations from previous president and prophets. Today, the 17th president and prophet is 96-year-old Russell Nelson. One of the mo more fascinating teachings of Mormonism is their understanding of God. What do they believe about God? Now, we, we say that we are monotheists. Christians believe in one God. We are also Trinitarian because we teach that this one God, one of essence and one of being, exists relationally as three persons. Monotheism is found uh, throughout the Old Testament in passages like Isaiah 43.10, where God says, Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. And in passages in the New Testament like 1 Timothy 1.17, uh, it says, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Mormons, on the other hand, believe that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three separate gods. They are not a united trinity. Not only that, but the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit used to be humans on another planet. One. What? Yes, they, they were once good, faithful Mormons. So when they died, they went to the highest level of heaven where they went through the process of becoming gods, and then they were given their own earth to rule. Mormons say that has been happening over and over and over all over the universe, that, and that's why they believe there are many, many, many gods in the universe. Not only that, good and faithful Mormons can aspire to become gods themselves. And if they're successful, if they're good enough, one day they will be given their own planet to rule. Whoa! Pretty heady stuff, right? To be a god someday? See, Mormons believe that gods and humans are the same species. Really? Though, if you're not good enough to graduate to be a god, hopefully you can at least become an angel. Since the line between God and humans is blurred, it's not surprising that Mormons believe that all people are preexistent. They say that the universe is populated with eternal intelligences. And this earth, our earth's uh, eternal father and eternal mother, who are physical beings, got together and had billions of spirit children. And this gave individuality to those vague eternal intelligences. And then these spirit children have to wait to be born into human bodies. And that's one reason why Mormon couples are urged, urged to have many babies. So more of these waiting spirit children can have bodies and begin the process on their way to godhood. Where do these beliefs come from? They come from Joseph Smith and his visions. Christian churches, we don't teach this stuff. Why? As we said before, it's because Christians receive the Bible as our authority for faith and practice, and we do not build our faith on sources that conflict with Scripture. As Christians, our hope is that on the day of resurrection, we will be purified and glorified, but we will not become gods. Our character will be cleansed, our flaws will be erased, and we will come into our full human glory. Romans 8, 21 says, then the creation itself will be liberated from bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. When I was a young pastor, 
a woman who had been raised a Mormon, came to me, made an appointment in my office, and said, well, how do you believe we get to the celestial kingdom? I go, what? What is that? Well, since then, I've learned that Joseph Smith uh, taught some unusual things about the afterlife. He said there is a celestial kingdom, a terrestrial kingdom, and a telestial kingdom, as well as an eternal hell. Where did he get this? Well, he got it by rewriting 1 Corinthians 15.40, which Mormons believe he had every right to do. Here's that verse in the King James Version, which is what would have been available to Smith. It says, there are celestial... Let's put it up on the screen. There we go. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. The Apostle Paul is comparing the bodies that we have in this life with the ones that we will have on the day of resurrection. We have terrestrial or earthly bodies now, and in the resurrection we will have celestial or heavenly bodies. Well, Joseph Smith completely rewrote this verse, so it's about two afterlife kingdoms, celestial and terrestrial, and then for good measure, he added a third place, a telestial kingdom. For the highest one is the celestial kingdom, which itself has different levels. And only by the strictest obedience to all the laws and ordinances of Mormonism can a person get to the highest level and have the opportunity to become a god. A lot of Mormons figure they're not going to be good enough to get that far. One requirement that you have, one of the many requirements, one requirement to reach the highest level of the celestial kingdom is that you have to be married in a Mormon temple. If you're single and live an otherwise exemplary Mormon life, you can still make it into the celestial kingdom, but on a lower level. And they believe that some of us, non-Mormons, if we're good people, and if we didn't hear or understand correctly Mormonism in our earthly life, and if we believe Mormonism in the afterlife, then we might get a lower-level apartment in the celestial kingdom. But we won't be in God's presence, and we won't be reunited with our families. And then eternal conditions get progressively worse in the terrestrial and telestial kingdoms. And who ends up in the Mormon version of hell? Well, Satan, the demons, wicked people who do not believe in the Mormon message even in the afterlife, and all ex-Mormons. Whoa. What do Mormons believe it takes to make it into the celestial kingdom? Well, it takes faith, sure, but you also have to earn your way there by doing everything the church says. For example, you must be baptized in a Mormon temple. And there, in your lifetime, there are other secret rituals you have to go through at a Mormon temple involving secret handshakes and sacred underwear. I'm not kidding. Those rituals are required to receive a superior salvation status. Oh, yeah, you also have to abstain from alcohol, tobacco, coffee, and tea. Well, there go the Methodists. <laughs> this is so different from the message in the Bible. The Christian gospel says that we are saved by grace through faith. One passage every Christian needs to know is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says, will you say it with me? For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Christians, we know we're not saved by our good works. We're not saved by our achievements, our accomplishments, even by our obedience. But we also say that this salvation that we receive by faith, it changes us changes our lives, and in, in the end, it produces good works in us. 
one other thing that Mormons are known for is uh, getting baptized for the dead, right? Some of you have heard this, yeah? Uh, all they need is a name, and a person can be baptized by proxy by a Mormon in a Mormon temple. And then if the person they were baptized for believes in Mormonism in their afterlife, then they can reach at least some portion of the celestial kingdom. Mormons don't call themselves Christians, at least not in our sense of the word. But they do believe that they are the only one true church. They operate under a different set of revelations. Yet, even within Mormonism, a portion of the biblical gospel remains. Andrew Jackson says, the LDS church does distort and twist many biblical truths concerning eternal, sal concerning eternal salvation, but it does confess and believe that Jesus was incarnated in the flesh, lived a perfect uh, and sinless life, died on the cross, was buried, was resurrected, and was and always will be the one and only messianic savior of the world. But Jackson adds that this portion of the gospel gets lost in all of the requirements they must fulfill. It gets lost in all of the, not in the layers of all the non-biblical beliefs. And this takes us back to the heart of my message today. Christians receive the Bible as our authority for faith and practice. And we do not build our faith on source, sources that conflict with Scripture. And I think we see in Mormonism the danger of building a faith that's in conflict with Scripture. One more thing I want to add about Mormonism is that when their missionaries go door to door, you've seen them, two by two, white shirts, right? They are most effective with lonely people who have a Christian background. They are most effective with lonely people who have a Christian background. Missionaries will share with that person a, a portion of the, the Book of Mormon that probably sounds more like the Bible. And then after they, you visit a while, they will, at the end, they will pray for you. And then they will ask you, how did it feel when we prayed for you? And if you say it felt good, then they will say, well, that's the Holy Spirit telling you that Mormonism is true. And once they draw you in the door, the Mormon believers will be so kind, so welcoming, that they can be hard to resist, especially for someone who's lonely. So... I say, stay true to the revelation of Jesus that comes to us from the first century scriptures, based on the eyewitnesses of people who knew Jesus. Stay true to the message that has been carried down through the ages that has brought the saving power of God to all who have believed it. As the Bible says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Let's pray. Dear God, we live in such a confusing world at a confusing time, and sometimes we just want to throw up our hands and give up believing anything. Save us, Lord Jesus, from that despair. Confirm in us that believing in you is what we need and it's all we need. In your name we pray, and all God's people said, amen.